in each of your names, and if you could just share whether or not you are here, that will help us determine that we do have a quorum for this one o'clock meeting today. Uh, so I'm gonna start at the beginning. Uh, Trustee um, Albrink. Trustee Camp. Here. Trustee Donahue. Here. Trustee Gravara. Trustee Manchin. And I believe that Trustee Manchin is here. I'm just wondering if you need to unmute your microphone. Here, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now, thank you. Uh, okay. Uh -huh. Uh, Trustee Norman. Here. Uh, Trustee Quinn is here. Trustee, Sp Trustee Speth. Here. And Trustee Welton. Present. Great. Uh, thank you all. Uh, with all of those that are here uh, virtually and in uh, physically in the room, we do have a quorum. So I do call our meeting to order. If you could please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America. The United States, States of America. Of America. And to, and the, to republic, the republic for which it stands, one, one, nation, one nation, under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and, justice and justice for all. For all. Thank you, everyone. That was uh, well done in uh, a very unique way. So uh, <laughs> maybe we'll have a chance to practice that the next time we do a virtual meeting. But thank you. Um, at this time, there uh, on our agenda, we do have 1.3 public comments. And we do not have any public uh, here at this time. So I'm moving on now to our minutes uh, under 1.4. These were the minutes from our board meeting of March 18th. Would someone like to make a motion? And if you would, if you could say your name first, that would be helpful. This is Kyle Welton, I so move. Thank you. Could someone say their name and second it, please? This is Nancy, I could second it. Okay, I believe I heard Nancy Manchin second it. I think I heard someone else as well, but for the record, we'll have Nancy Manchin uh, second our minutes. Any discussion under our minutes? All those in favor of the minutes, please state aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. And at this time, uh, if you would like to uh, take the time to mute your uh, phones, uh, we will then continue on to the next order of business on our agenda uh, under 2.1, update on services. I plan to, uh, before I um, turn it over to uh, Garrett, I would just like to uh, share a few words uh, in regards to this very unique time that we're in. Um, and I just wanted to um, really thank all of you as trustees and uh, library employees for your patience as we've been navigating uh, through this uh, very unique time and still trying to provide excellent uh, library services online. Um, and I just wanted to make a personal point of uh, just sharing that I've been so impressed uh, with the leadership of uh, Library Director er Garrett Erickson, managers Melissa Prentice and Cheryl Newsom Nessman, Debbie D'Amico, and the entire uh, Mead Public Library staff. I, really feel that they are in action uh, of what our whole mission stands for, which is creativity, innovation, and really trying to connect our community during this challenging time. Uh, so those are just my personal words that I wanted to share before we learn more about um, how the library is continuing to offer services online. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Library Director Garrett Erickson. And so, am I actually live? Um, apparently, when you get a green light, 
it's Let me request it again. Oh, he'll lay it up here. And then just press on all right. Oh, now I'm red. Okay. All right. We're learning how to make the system work. So, uh, Garrett Erickson. Thank you, Maeve. I'm actually going to have Melissa start off this report. And, it, and since her staff is really innovating by the day and sort of learning um, new digital platforms and so on, I'm going to have Melissa start. If there's anything I can fill in towards the end, I will jump in as well. So, Melissa, are you ready to give this report? I am. Hi everyone, this is Melissa Prentice, Public Services Manager. And uh, first I just want to publicly acknowledge and express my gratitude uh, for the overall positivity and adaptability of our public services staff. It's hard to believe it's only been two weeks since we closed to the public and just one week of all of us working from home. Uh, during that time, our staff has responded readily to the rapidly changing nature of their work. We've spent the better part of this week learning, using, troubleshooting uh, new remote work technologies, tools, and content delivery systems, um, including calendars and schedules, work logs, staff logs, online meeting platforms, remote phone and chat services, and even learning how to do video production from our homes so we can deliver programs remotely. Um, and I just wanted to say an especially big thank you to Chase and Annalisa for being pilots, really, and getting all of our staff up to speed on these things. So with that said, um, a few specifics on some of the stuff we're working on. So we are still providing reference services and other assistance to our patrons via phone, email, and chat services. Um, those services are available Monday through Friday from 9 to 5. And we, while we are certainly not seeing the same volume we would be if we were open, um, there has been a steady and daily inflow of patron interactions, primarily assistance with online card registration and accessing our e-content. Additionally, we are developing and delivering programs and community engagement as much as we can while we're closed. A few examples, uh, we hosted our first online book club last week. And our staff is also updating our blog several times a week to highlight specific titles and resources from our digital collection. I'm sure you've seen some of those on our Facebook page already. Uh, we did a couple posts, including digital cookbooks that cover food storage and cooking on a budget, uh, feel-good movies, stress management for parents, uh, Gale courses. And uh, just this week, we're adding uh, Little Rev's ukulele classes will be offered uh, via Facebook Live for the entire month of April. And that starts tonight, actually, at 6.15 and every Thursday throughout the month. Um, we're also developing some children's programming, like story times, that will be shared on Facebook. And Josh has been queuing up all of this content to share in such a way that we don't overwhelm our feed or inundate all our followers, but it will still be a steady flow of content coming out. Um, so in addition to that, our reference team is working on developing some uh, COVID-19 related FAQs and guides to post on our Facebook page, but also on the doors of our building to share with food pantries and shelters as well. Uh, knowing that many of the folks in our community do not have access to the internet or other reliable sources of information due to housing insecurity and other factors, uh, we want to be sure that we're providing this content um, in a technology-free format as well. So this would include info from county and state health departments, as well as information on food, housing, and healthcare resources, as well as information on the stimulus checks and expanded unemployment benefits. Um, so that's sort of the public facing stuff we're working on. But in addition to that, staff are also continuing their collection development work. We're sort of preparing and rethinking our plans for summer and fall programming and taking on some database cleanup projects in Polaris. And just one final thing I wanted to share was some of our e-content stats from the last two weeks. So our streaming services, which is Hoopla and Canopy, saw over 100 new users in a two-week period with circulations up um, by about 200 overall from February. And then Overdrive, that's the e-book e platform, 
um, that you use Libby to access. Our certs have been up by 300 and our new users have doubled when we compare that number with March of last year. And finally, Easy Proxy, uh, which is the way people log in for our other e-resources like Rosetta Stone, Ancestry, Consumer Reports, New York Times, that sort of thing. Um, those unique logins were at 573 this March compared to 209 last March. So that is a 174% increase. Um, so those are all my updates unless anyone has questions for me. Uh, thank you, Melissa. Uh, does anyone have any questions for her at this time? And please remember to share your name first. All right, I think I'm going to call on Garrett Erickson, and I think I know what button I'm supposed to push. And I just wanted to add one thing that Chase is actually working on, our IT guy. Um, we are in the process of moving our access points from within the building to the west side of the building, which is uh, on facing the parking lot, so that if people want to use uh, the wireless service during the day, they can, um, and they could do it from the safety of their own car. So we know that a lot of people don't have access to the internet, but still use that vital service that we provide. So we are trying to realign physically the, the wiring and the and all that. Chase has it all set up and we just simply need to test it before we start to market that. So that should be up and going within a day or so. Uh, this is Maeve and uh, just wanted to echo my uh, thanks to um, all of the new programming that has been created by the library staff and the fact that you actually have uh, Josh Linter who can then creatively put it up on various platforms to share the news that we have new online resources. And then of course, none of that would happen if we didn't have our IT specialist Chase really making sure that all of those components can work. So it's uh, really quite wonderful to, to witness just how well all of you communicate and collaborate uh, together to get good services for our citizens. And uh, if there's no other comments, I will move then on to 2.2 human resource policy changes. Okay, I think we'll move on to 2.2, and I'm gonna turn this over again to uh, Garrett Erickson. And so this has uh, been a, an incredibly fast-paced bunch of changes. Not only last week were we waiting to hear uh, with the state, after the state had made, uh, Governor Evers had made his change to stay at home, but then the federal government was working on their own set of guidelines and laws, and then um, just uh, working at this from a local level as well. There was so much going on all at once. Um, and so locally here, we were trying to follow what the federal government was going to do. And so we do uh, have a policy change that we'll talk about momentarily. We'll have uh, Administrator Hofflin speak. Um, I just want to say before that, uh, Everyone needed within the city, according to the, I believe the federal government, um, Administrator Hofflin needed to make choices on who is deemed essential versus non-essential. And so a lot of this policy that Daryl will talk about is, uh, is pertains to the library specifically because we have, uh, we're the one department that has quite a few part-time people. And in this case, they were deemed non-essential. And, and by doing that, this is a group of people that mostly shelves physical items within the library. And so at this point, we don't have a lot for them that they can do from at home. And so uh, this particular policy especially affects those folks that weren't deemed essential. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Daryl and he can talk about the new policy that's um, he uh, and Chuck and some others authored, Vicki as well. Uh, thank you, Director Erickson. Uh, as you uh, correctly identified, uh, the city wanted to, uh, you know, encourage uh, em employees um, to, you know, be part of our, our overall city of Sheboygan family, and we wanted to you know, make them whole uh, during this, this difficult time. As a result, uh, in addition to incorporating uh, some of the federal law and creating a a, sort of a master or comprehensive policy, uh, we wanted to address specifically the issue of employees who 
were deemed non-essential uh, using uh, federal and state standards or definitions and uh, really come up with something we thought would address at least the short-term goal of the city to make these employees whole who are non-essential and no longer have the ability to to provide work uh, for us. So again, these employees are not telecommuting. The city uh, decided uh, late last Friday to place and create policy uh, really to mimic the state of Wisconsin, uh, what the governor uh, has put in place for those employees, including University of Wisconsin uh, employees. And that was a category that we refer to as you know, COVID uh, leave. Uh, 80 hours was identified and placed into that policy. And as I mentioned, it was um, issued uh, late uh, last Friday. We know that for many employees, those two weeks uh, come and go fairly quickly. So already uh, we are receiving questions from those employees and, and those that are in our payroll as to what will happen after the two weeks is over. Uh, city staff has been discussing now for a couple weeks the possibility should there not be further sort of direction uh, that we can mimic uh, by the state of Wisconsin that uh, we will consider. And what I want to discuss with you today is the possibility or probability that we will, unless again we receive further uh, identification by the state, uh, an 80-20 split whereby 80% of the city, 80% of the staff's time, whether they're full or part-time status, will continue and will continue to be, in essence, an administrative leave category. What we're asking the employees to do uh, on the 20% is to assign uh, their discretionary or vacation PTO. Uh, we also recognize for some employees, uh, those hours may be limited or the employees may be, as a result of maybe being uh, new to the organization. And so we uh, also want to identify that uh, sh should they find themselves in a position of having zero leave status, uh, especially for vacation PTO, that we will consider and will allow them to, in essence, borrow into the next calendar year, 2021. Uh, now, I, I'm, I'm giving you an idea as to the draft language that we're working on. Uh, as you can imagine, we continue to receive updates from the federal government and state. Uh, my concern is uh, not making almost daily updates to our policy, which creates even more confusion and, uh, and uncertainty. Uh, as an example, we received an update uh, this, uh, early, uh, earlier today from uh, Derek Mink, our, our um, Shoreline Metro director of some new federal uh, legislation or directives, which we will have to incorporate into our, our policy. Uh, which deals specifically with transit-related employees. As I mentioned, uh, we originally piggybacked, at least for this week and next week, uh, 80 hours of administrative leave consistent with the state of Wisconsin for their employees. I put a call and talked with some state officials, asking them what happens after the 80 hours are up for state employees. Are they going to add an additional 80 hours or additional number of hours? Uh, so I'm waiting for that uh, call back. Um, so, sh uh, so unless we receive sort of further um, identification from the state, uh, no doubt the city has the ability to be independent. Um, but uh, at this point, our draft language is uh, an 80% uh, additional administrative leave, asking the employees to sort of share in our effort uh, by identifying Let's make the numbers easy on a 40-hour work week. Um, 32 hours would be an additional administrative leave beyond the 80. That's already been uh, identified. And we would ask the employees to add to that 40 hours, eight hours of an assign, assignment or allocation of their uh, vacation or discretionary PTO bank. Vicki, I know as acting uh, HR director, uh, you've been working with me on this. Uh, any any thoughts or comments that you have? I think you covered it, Daryl. Um, the two weeks, just for clarity, begins began on Monday, so the 30th, and will go through April 10th or 11th. That's Saturday. That's the end of our next pay period, but most people would be um, on that Friday date. 
Uh, we do expect that things will change probably within these next two weeks. So uh, all employees will be covered uh, per, per the norm for their payroll period. And then looking to April 13th would be the start of this 80% 80, 80 city supported, 20% employees supported through their vacation time. Um, we expect this to go perhaps through the 24th, but maybe even until April 30th, depending on if Governor Evers uh, matches uh, what President Trump has suggested that April 30th would be the date. Um, again, we're, we are paying attention daily, sometimes hourly, to the changes that are coming out as far as what guidance we have. We have many resources to use for understanding the different policies and legislation that are coming through. Uh, it has been our effort from the beginning to ensure that our employees, no matter where they are located, are kept whole and to relieve as much anxiety for them through this period of time. Um, and I'm very grateful for the administration to be able to say that, um, that we do support our whole family of uh, city employees because it's unknown territory, and we are concerned about everyone's welfare. So if you have any questions. Uh, this is uh, Maeve Quinn. Thank you both for uh, sharing uh, some comments. I'm just going to turn this back over to Daryl Hoffman because he has something he'd like to add. Yeah, uh, thank you, Chair Quinn. Uh, the, the goal, really, of the city is not to place any employees into a, a position of having to file for unemployment. Uh, we want to keep them on the payroll, and so we're working very hard to find a way to, to make that happen. Uh, thank you. This is uh, Maeve Quinn uh, speaking again. Uh, I just wanted to um, share that uh, uh, some information that I had shared in an email to all of my trustees that uh, within the city of Sheboygan, um, Daryl Hoffland as city administrator is determining the policy for all the city employees. This is not a policy that he needs to bring forward to the city council to get approval. And so it was my um, thinking that that's very much in, in line with having Garrett Erickson as library director oversees the employees within Mead Public Library. In conversation with Chuck Adams, our city attorney, uh, he felt that it would be um, uh, wise that that the board of trustees would would actually uh, support the decisions that Garrett Erickson would have following this policy or perhaps a different policy. But our city attorney has shared that uh, he thinks it's uh, beneficial uh, that the library board does weigh in on the um, actual policy. And I wanted to share with all of you that I'm sorry that um, the eight-page um, rough draft document um, has not been shared with you at this point in time. Uh, we had hoped to do that prior to our original virtual meeting on Friday, which we then canceled because we didn't think with the latest uh, information coming from Washington, D.C. and the new bill and everything, we knew that the city policy would have to be changed anyway. So we uh, uh, deferred our meeting to this week. Uh, in looking at the policy on Friday uh, is when we noticed that in the eight-page document there was no uh, mention of what I think is a, a, a very unique uh, plan to offer 80, 20 percent. Uh, and it was then shared that that was an omission just because there was so much important information to get into the policy. Uh, so uh, it is my understanding that um, the language that uh, Daryl Hoffman has just commented on, as well as Vicki Vicky Schneider, that that is what will be added into uh, the policy. At this point, I don't have a, a copy of it myself, uh, so we're just getting this uh, information uh, verbally from both of them. And I appreciate having both of them come to the meeting to share that with us. Uh, uh, Daryl Hoffman would like to uh, speak at this time. Yeah. So, uh, so, so thank you for, for your comments uh, and, and, and continued support. Uh, for, uh, if, if Garrett hasn't already done so, uh, by all means, uh, we will uh, make sure that electronic copy is available so uh, library board 
of trustees members can receive a copy uh, of their own. Um, what we can do as well is we can share with you uh, the draft version so you can see uh, we have kind of a track change format so you can see the, the changes that we are proposing to make at this time. Again, I, I caution you in that uh, it is only a draft. Um, uh, as I mentioned, we're getting pressure from our payroll department to implement as soon as possible so they can start changing uh, the payroll software. And again, begin to alert staff, uh, just because I know that, uh, there is a lot of anxiousness, uh, deservedly so, out there. Um, and so again, uh, I anticipate within a day, uh, we will probably firm up these changes and, and go ahead and make the announcement and distribute the revised uh, uh, pandemic or contagious illness policy that incorporates some of the issues that we're talking about today. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, this is Maeve Quinn. I'm just turning it over to Garrett Erickson to see if he has any additional words. And we're, we're attempting to there make we it go. work. Okay, we got it now. Um, I don't have anything to add about the policy itself. I guess I just uh, would like to hear from the rest of the trustees if that they think that's a fair plan. And, um, and at this time, I believe a phone is ringing, but I don't know what that means. I'm looking over at the <laughs> technology experts. Uh, but at this time, if there's any board of trustee member that has a comment or a question, uh, please uh, share your name and uh, go ahead and state your question or comment. Thank you. Hi, Maeve, this is Mary Lynn. Hello. Um, greetings all. Uh, I just wanted to follow up uh, as your alder uh, liaison that I um, I think that this policy, uh, which was really put together uh, with, of course, lightning speed, uh, really is attending in the very best way we can to all of the needs of our employees and to the public that we serve. Um, and <clears throat> so I'm, it's my hope that we will all be supportive of it. Uh, these are <laughs> these are just crazy, crazy tough, very, very tough times. And I know that we all have families who have stories of hardship and danger and anxiety. Uh, but under the circumstances, I think this is terrific. Plus, I also just wanted to say, um, in response to all of the activities that Melissa reported, um, the staff is just doing an extraordinary job. And um, I'm gonna let my brother-in-law know about the online ukulele uh, instruction because he's a big fan of Little Rev and even bought his own uke. And so just overall, I'm hoping that there's good support for this. Thanks. Thank you, Mary Lynn. Anyone else like to share their thoughts or uh, any questions you might have? So at this point, I'm, I'm assuming no one has uh, any question or comment. If you have been sharing, and uh, it might mean that your phone is on mute, so I'm going to give you a moment to unmute yourself and just see if you do have a question or comment. Okay. This is Kathy. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, good. I just can't tell if it's muted or unmuted. Um, so I'm trying to understand how this changed from what we had thought before because it was still kind of in process. Is the 80-20 thing the, the change that up until what the, our first impression was that it was going to be less or more, and then it, at week three it changes? I'm just trying to understand what, what is the new information. So this is Vicki. So uh, this is Maeve. Um, I, I guess 
what I can share is that when we began these initial conversations about what the city plan would be, uh, the conversation shared uh, the idea of the 80-20 uh, compensation plan. Uh, so that is what we thought we would be seeing in the plan on Friday. We were hoping we would have a meeting on Friday, but it seemed because of the federal bill being passed, I think Thursday or Wednesday, uh, the city just needed more time to incorporate all of that good information. When the policy did come out on Friday, it did not include the 80-20. And that was, from my understanding, oh. they shared it was an oversight. And so now oh, okay. they are still working, because there's still new information being shared that needs to be part of this eight-page policy. They are hoping to, uh, uh, you know, uh, put it together in the next day or two, it sounds like, and then that will uh, incorporate the any new information as well as any omissions, and it's my understanding that that policy will have the 80-20. And that's, I'm sorry for the confusion, but uh, there's, this process has been um, a little challenging with all the new information coming from Washington, D.C. And I am now going to mm -hmm. turn it over to Daryl Hoffman because he looks like he has a question or a comment that might illuminate this a little bit further. Uh, th thank you, Chair Quinn. The the, you know the challenge with this new prog the new programs and the directives given by the federal government is that oftentimes uh, we're we're hearing some of the terminology for the first time and unfortunately fortunately or unfortunately to make the, the information easy for people to understand we're using similar terms and I think as a result that's creating you know some it has the potential of creating confusion so again I, I just want to reiterate that the 80 hours that were incorporated into the city's uh, policy are in addition to anything that's been identified by the federal government. Uh, as an example, uh, for employees that are affected uh, by the closing of schools, closing of a child care provider, have uh, symptoms associated with uh, COVID-19, uh, there is an identification in that uh, new federal legislation of this, of or employees, again, I think 500 employees or less, employers with 500 uh, employees or less, providing two weeks of leave, paid leave. And then I think like a two-thirds after that. The, the 80 hours that the city uh, incorporated into its policy late Friday is in addition to that federal legislation, a completely separate program, completely paid for and, and, and with the discretion by the city. So again, we know that if there's, we know under this really an, an extension or an enhancement of the Family Medical Leave Act is really what the federal government's policy is working from. But the 80 hours that we incorporated into the policy late Friday is completely separate from any federal uh, directives, hours, benefits identified, and is, as I mentioned, similar to what the state of Wisconsin did as the state is an employer. They, they went out on their own, created this 80-hour bank of hours, and we decided to mimic that, not that we were required to or forced to at the state level. So again, we're looking at beyond this next pay period, which assumes that if an employee is full-time, they would have exhausted that initial 80 hours. And so that's where we're looking at this 80-20 split going forward beyond, um, I think it's as... Um, Vicki mentioned on April 13th, we would yep. uh, start this 80-20 split. Hopefully my, my additional uh, comments are, are helpful. Um, going, yeah, back, going, back to, no, I was gonna say, going back to Kathy, did you have any questions or comments based on what you just heard? No, no, that helped, because I, I just wasn't understanding the, the, the evolution of this. <clears throat> but it seems like a, a good, fair thing for our employees. I, I guess I am just curious, is this is the library the main one, the main entity where this is such an important issue? Or are there other city employees who are also facing the same kind of quandary, being sort of in a non-essential state? I, I think I can answer that in in looking on how city employees were classified in our city. I think we have probably more 
uh, employees that have been classified as non-essential and probably more that are part-time, even though uh, for our employees, for a lot of them, it's their sole source of income, so it's a, a, a real um, hardship for them if, if we don't put together a policy that can help them during this challenging time. But I don't know if Vicki or... I, I, I Vicki, I can speak to that. Sure. Um, we have, so I don't like the term non-essential, um, just, mm -hmm. just to say, um, but I think we, we did create a chart looking at job responsibilities, and so there's really two components to it. Could you be classified as emergency responder, essential, non-essential, but also could you do perform work at home or not through telecommuting or some kind of project work. And so I'm actually happy to say, and I shared this with Daryl, that through this exercise of doing this, that we discovered that the city runs pretty lean and there are very few employees uh, who are actually in fall in that classification of non-essential and cannot telecommute in some kind of way. So it, it has affected transit workers because of reduced schedule it affects a custodian at the senior activity center because we're not cleaning the building and um, he cannot do that work at his home. Uh, it it uh, is mostly, again, uh, library employees and um, everyone else, for the most part, has been able to pick up projects or do things outside of their uh, their normal duties and we are also looking at ways that we perhaps can use pages for special projects that maybe are outside the library realm but might help other departments for those projects that you can never quite get done. Um, so everyone in my opinion is essential to the good of the community. It's just a, a really unfortunate kind of term that is used. Mm -hmm. I guess I, I, this is Maeve, I concur, concur with the unfortunate term, and you know, if librarians were in charge of this bill, all of the terms and all of the acronyms would make sense, but, uh, but you know, I guess we can't send our librarians to Washington, D.C. to help at this time, so uh, thank, you, thank you for your comments. Um, are there any other uh, questions or comments regarding um, this policy? This is Cheryl Nussman, um, Support Services Manager. Uh, so the pages fall under my department, and I just wanted to let everybody know that we have been able to find um, some limited work for these people to do from home, uh, not enough to, to cover their, their full schedule for a week, but about half of that. Um, not sure when that work is going to uh, run out, but we're, we're giving them what we can right now. And our idea behind doing that was to take those COVID-19 leave hours that, that um, they could take and extending that out to the full four weeks. So instead of having them use up all, the, all of that leave the first two weeks, um, spreading it out over the four weeks so that they would not have to go into that 80-20. Oh, th thank you, Cheryl. I, I also, this is Maeve speaking, not following my own rules here, sorry. Um, I just wanted to thank you, Cheryl, too, for the incredible list of um, projects and things that you and your staff have come up with uh, to really uh, continue to provide services. But not only that, really build the knowledge and skill of our staff. I really was impressed with the suggestions of various um, ways that they can be utilizing this time to uh, hone their skills so that they have more to offer us when they come back into our building. So uh, uh, I, I'm planning to share your uh, long list with our, our trustees after this meeting, but I, I, I was most impressed with the creativity and just how amazing our library is going to be when we get to open the doors again. So thank you. At this time, is there I any... I do have one question. This is, this is Kathy Norman. I... My question is, when, when the library reopens and the drive-throughs, you know, are open and a, just a huge amount of books get returned all at once because everybody's waiting and, you know, due dates are long past, isn't there going to be a whole bunch of extra work for the pages to do? I can't help thinking that maybe some hours get made up on the back end 
you know, that get lost on the front end because there's going to be so much work to do for the first few weeks we're back open. That, that's an interesting idea, and I'm turning it right over to Garrett Erickson. <laughs> There we go. So uh, I know Cheryl's been doing a lot of planning with her staff, uh, thinking about this very issue, Kathy. Um, one of the things we're talking about is uh, not requiring people to bring it all back the day the library opens, but over the course of basically a week, and hopefully um, by staggering it, that would help a little bit. Um, Cheryl, did you want to chime in on other ideas? I know that's the main one we've been talking about. Right, so this is Cheryl. Um, and this question is going across Monarch and libraries across the US right now, if not the world. Um, so my own personal thoughts on it are to uh, extend our due date out at least two weeks beyond our the days that we open up to the public and that we actually open up our, our drive-through book drops uh, before we open to the public to kind of widen that window that people have of returning their items. Um, that said, we know we're still gonna get slammed. So uh, we are going to be reducing project work uh, or you know extra work that they might've been doing on mending books or other things and really just kind of double up staffing on uh, on that book return process and reshelving everything like that. Um, I do, you know, that's an interesting idea though about maybe uh, it, it, it's hard to predict if we would need those extra hours, but you know, maybe we can think about giving ourselves that, that buffer of saying, mm -hmm. well, we're going to pay these people ahead of time, maybe give them an extra, um, if, if they're only able to, you know, if they're getting, they're into that 80-20, maybe instead of having them take vacation for that 20, we're, we're tracking that as far as how many hours that is and then having them work those extra hours once we're back open or once we've yeah. started opening up. Yeah, because then we know, have a better chance. I guess, yeah. yeah, we have a better chance of making them whole. I mean, mm -hmm. that is if they can work those extra hours once we open back right. up, but I just think there's going to be, at least in the short term, a lot of extra work that's going to need to be done. Yeah, so maybe we'd have to um, talk to, to Vicki about that at a, a later time and, to see if that's something we can do. And uh, you, it's almost like you had a, a miracle ball and noticed that Vicki was waving her hand at me, <laughs> wanting to chime in on the conversation. So I'm going to turn this over to Vicki Schneider. Um, I just have one thing to, as, a, as a caution about this, because we were talking about this in a, in a different context uh, among the, my HR team, that we have to be careful because of the way that your employees are classified, that they do not go over a certain number of hours in the past 52 week period so that you, you could change your, your, you know, your whole classification, whether it's benefits and such things, which co could, some benefit changes are permanent changes then, so just to be aware of that. So if somebody goes over their 20 hours in the, consecutively or consistently, that, that could cause a different kind of concern. So just, just so you're aware. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, any other last questions or comments? Is Debbie speaking. I am tracking the pages hours so that we don't go over that limit. Um, we know how many hours they need to stay under and I think we have a little bit of a cushion there um, but we can talk about that you know at the time. So, All right yeah. thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? I'm uh, just wondering if uh, someone would like to move to authorize Library Director Garrett Erickson to determine the contagious temporary illness policy uh, for Mead Public Library. This is Kyle Welton, I shall move. Is there a second? This is Gary. Second. Is there any further discussion? 
This would allow um, Garrett to receive the um, updated version and he can make a determination whether or not uh, the policy reflects the conversations that we've had and that we think it's in the best interest of our um, city employees that work in the library. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. That will allow us to maybe not have to meet next week. So, <laughs> so I appreciate that. And thank you to Daryl and Vicki for joining our meeting in person from more than six feet away. So I appreciate it. Uh, all right. Um, Moving on then to uh, 2.3, building projects, because just because there's a COVID-19 pandemic, it doesn't mean that our library isn't constantly thinking ahead. Uh, so I'm gonna turn this over to Garrett Erickson on the building projects. Okay, this is Garrett, and I'll just start this conversation off. I'm actually going to have Cheryl mainly and a little bit of Debbie um, helping us out as well. But the thought here is that um, right now we're closed to the public, and for the most part, we don't have many staff in the building either. We have generally a half dozen or so staff in the building each day. So if we are able to get some contractors in, it's a great time for us to make some physical changes in the building um, with nobody there. And so we did uh, send out a list of four projects, I believe, and we're going to have uh, Cheryl and Debbie go through each of those projects for you. So at this time, um, Hi, Cheryl is going to speak first, I believe. Go ahead. Thank you. Sure. This is Cheryl. Um, so for many of these projects we have uh, mentioned at previous board meetings, so they should be somewhat familiar to you. Um, the first one that is listed though is uh, we are going to be what we'd like to do is switch out our current fluorescent lighting that we have in our stairways and uh, outside of the building and uh, change that over to LED lighting. This in the long run will probably save the, the library um, quite a bit of money. Um, but what we're looking at doing is uh, again stairway lighting that's in the main stairway, stairwell that the, the public uses. And then we are also looking at doing um, the lighting by the front entrance canopy, also the columns, and our uh, exterior soffit lighting. And that project uh, has been quoted at just over $9,000. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions or comments about those projects from any of my trustees? All right, it looks like uh, maybe Debbie would like to speak next in regards to the projects. Okay, I'm online now. Um, what we're looking at is upgrading all of the administrative office furniture um, where we have the desks that you can either rise or sit down our um, furniture in here, I think, has been since the library opened when I was a page in 1974. And seeing as we are going to be having the carpet replaced in the downstairs area and maintenance is going to be painting the entire administrative office, we just felt that it was a good time that maybe we could upgrade our furniture and then our phase of it would be completely um, finished. So. Uh, thank you for that update. Are there any questions or comments for um, Debbie? Well, this, this is Kathy. My question is just where is this coming from in the budget? This is, these are all 850 funds. Oh, this is 850. Okay. To you. Yep. All right. Mm -hmm. If you notice on the bottom of this thing, I put what the market was at on 3.30 because I'm watching um, the market almost daily between the foundation, the 850 funds, and the other trust that, you know, is for the library. And so what I did is I subtracted these projects and I showed how much as of 30th that would still be in the 850 funds that are over okay. a million. And then also, I mean, we do have some other projects. They're a little more expensive, but we thought these were projects that we picked we could have done while the library is closed 
Um, the other projects would probably take a little longer time, and I'm still getting some additional option quotes on those. All right, that uh, is helpful. Thank you. This is Maeve. Uh, and then I think we're going back to Cheryl to talk about uh, interior, exterior painting stairwells, although I think you mentioned that, but maybe the metal doors. So project number 10. Sure. So um, when I spoke before, we were talking about changing out the LED lighting. This is actually painting the stairwells, and, and you're correct. I did mention it at an earlier meeting. Um, our own maintenance staff is able to do probably 90% of the painting within the building, but there are some areas, um, mainly the stairwells, which uh, are going to require some, some specialized equipment to get to the, the higher up areas to paint. So um, we are looking at, let me see here, um, there's one staff stairwell that we're going to have painted, the main public stairwell excluding the uh, murals that are there. Those will not be touched. Um, and we have a couple of uh, emergency stairwells that uh, had work done on them, I think a couple years ago. Those right now only have primer on them, so we'd like to put some actual paint on them. And then uh, we were also looking at the, the staff entrance foyer and 10 exterior doors that need paint. All right, thank you. Any questions about the interior, exterior painting, stairwells, emergency exit, metal doors? Project number 10. Uh, then moving on to the last item, the last project that has been shared with us is uh, project number 15, material return room. Um, and I'm gonna turn that over to Cheryl. Okay, um, so this is the, the room that we talked about a little bit at our, our last in-person meeting up in the Roca room. Um, the room is, will be designed to withstand heat. It says, I think on the plan here, 120, but it's actually 140 degrees. Uh, we will be heating the room to what we're calling cleanse items. Um, it will be an eight by eight room located in the, the page workroom where we are, where uh, items are returned and checked. Uh, and it will include a heater, a fan, and an exhaust system. Uh, thank you. Um, I think it's uh, well timed that uh, that this was discussed prior to the. Uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, that just knowing that all those thousands and thousands of books that are going to be returned, that it would be wonderful to have um, this room up and ready as soon as possible. So I'm, I'm really pleased that this is on the list, and I like its new name of Material Return Room. So thank you. Um, any questions or comments on any one of the uh, four projects that have been shared today? With that, uh, would someone like to make a motion to um, go ahead and approve these four building projects? I'll move to approve the four building projects. All right, and that is... This is Med, second. Okay, was that Kathy that made the motion? Mm-hmm, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, thank you. Uh, then we just have a couple of quick uh, updates, uh, turning it over to uh, Garrett Erickson on 2.4. As soon as I remember to actually turn his microphone on. Sorry about that. Thank you, Maeve, you've got it. So uh, yes, just a couple quick updates on uh, 2.4. Um, on Tuesday, the library will be is still going to be uh, used as a polling station. And so what we'll do is have it, of course, in the Roka room with the gate down so that uh, no one can go into the uh, further into the library. Um, so Meredith, our uh, clerk, has been working hard to get polling workers. Um, and we'll be uh, 
basically they will be doing most of their own cleaning of the room. I know there's concerns about how, whether we would need to have extra maintenance staff uh, handling that. We actually, she's not requested that. So they plan on uh, doing their own cleaning of the room. Um, but we will have one of one or actually both of our maintenance people will be there to, to, to be in the building as well uh, as needed. So okay. any uh, questions or comments on the uh, polling station at Mead Public Library on election day? All right, uh, moving on then to 2.5 personnel update. So then uh, the last 2.5 is uh, we do have one update of a key person that we um, lost about a week ago. So Don Clister, our uh, security specialist, has taken a job. Uh, uh, she's gone back to the women's shelter in town um, where we actually had taken her from a couple, uh, almost two years ago. And uh, Don will be a manager there. So um, we are right now trying to think of our strategy on when we want to hire, whether it's appropriate to try and hire now or just wait in, uh, a little bit until this all passes. And so uh, we just wanted to mention Dawn uh, taking the, the other job. I know a lot of you have worked with Dawn and she was excellent at what she did for us. Um, I was very uh, sad to, to hear this news, but I'm you know certainly pleased for uh, Safe Harbor because uh, as all of you would probably concur, she is just excellent in her uh, problem solving skills and her ability to connect with people and helping to empower them to solve problems. So uh, if anything, uh, I think the library uh, certainly learned from her of how this role can just be so uh, beneficial for not only our library staff, but also for all members of our community. So it's, I think it's given us an opportunity to recognize what an important role that is in our library. And it didn't exist two years ago. So um, I, uh, I, I think it's going to be a, 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 a challenging position to, to fill, but I know we've got high standards. And of course, everyone wants to work at the library. So hopefully we'll get lots of interested people when we do get to that point. Any other questions or comments from any of you? Well, this is Kathy. My thought is maybe right now isn't the best time to start looking because people are not even thinking rationally or doing normal job searching. But I also don't think we have to wait until everything is up and running and humming perfectly again. Um, probably sooner rather than later, get started looking. Like maybe when things start to reopen slowly, it might be a time to go out and put out the Indeed job, you know, start looking, start putting it out there. Thank you for that. Anyone else? So um, at this point, I just want to share that uh, most likely uh, we will be doing our next uh, Board of Trustee meeting virtually again on uh, April 23rd uh, on, at 3.45. Um, hopefully by then I will know what button I'm supposed to push to <laughs> let Garrett speak or anyone else. Um, it's quite the system up here on the third floor of City Hall. Um, and. Uh, at this point in time, uh, the finance uh, committee meeting will meet prior, uh, but we will get more information about all of that later in April. At this time, would someone like to make a motion to adjourn? I'll move to adjourn. It's Kathy. Okay. Is Kyle, I'll second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone wants to oppose? <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you all. Continue to be safe. And I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to have us meet on various important topics. Um, may, may, you, uh, may you and your family and friends stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maeve.